As Jakob was becoming very successful, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was kind of falling apart. It lost a lot of its land to a Cossack rebellion in the Ukraine, a Russian invasion, and starting in 1655, to the Swedish. This whole thing is part of a series of events known as the Deluge, which is very interesting if not convoluted. The only thing we need to know is that Jakob's neutral foreign policy didn't save Jakob this time. Jakob didn't invest much into the duchy's military, so its military power was practically non-existent. Jakob tried to pay Sweden huge sums of money and he allied with the Duke of Brandenburg, Prussia, whose sister was Jakob's wife. Prussia ended up allying itself with Sweden. Karl X, the Swedish king, didn't see any reason to leave Courland and Semigalia alone, so his army went to Yelgawa and captured Jakob. The army didn't face any resistance. Jakob lived in custody in Riga for a bit, and then in Ivangorod. While Jakob was gone, the duchy dealt with the almost complete collapse. The production of goods was almost completely halted. The duchy couldn't contact its colonies. It was ravaged by Swedish, Lithuanian, and even Prussian troops. Just in case it wasn't bad enough, a terrible epidemic killed roughly one-third of the duchy's population. One. Third. It's hard to wrap your head around. In 1660, the war was over and Jakob was returned to the duchy. He was a rising star in Europe. He had an insane trade network, colonies, connections. Now he was left with a duchy that was a husk of its former self. He even had to cede some territory to Sweden. He would spend the rest of his reign rebuilding the economy. And his colonies? Well, they were both taken from Jakob. The situation with the colonies is more interesting than Jakob's domestic policies, so from now I'll focus on that. Let's start with the Gambia. In 1659, the Dutch West India Company pressured Henry Momber, who's described as an agent or commissioner of the Duke in Amsterdam, to accept a contract that gave all of Jakob's colonies in Africa to the company until Jakob could resume ownership. This would allow the settlements to be maintained while Jakob was imprisoned. Momber did send a message to Otto, the guy who was in charge of the Gambia settlements, that if he could resist the Dutch, then he should. He couldn't, so the settlements were given over to the company. The Dutch only got the colony for a few months before a French pirate, probably working for the Kingdom of Sweden, attacked St. Andrew's Island and absolutely destroyed it. After that happened, the Amsterdam Chamber, the chamber of the Dutch West India Company that was in charge of these settlements, gave it to a different chamber the Greningen Chamber. This chamber wasn't keen on keeping it either, so they told Momber that he could have the colony back. Momber was very happy to hear that since Jakob was released around a month before that and Momber didn't want to piss off Jakob by telling him that he gave away the African colony. So a contract was signed in 1660, Otto Steele was in charge again, but there was trouble already. Apparently the Amsterdam Chamber didn't want Greningen to just give away the colony, so a couple of their ships went to St. Andrew's Island. They took the island and took some Corlanders, including Otto, hostage. Some native tribes interfered, whatever that means, and successfully got the Dutch to leave again. So after that, even after Jakob got restored to his position, Jakob still held on to the Gambia. Well, kinda. They pretty much only held on to St. Andrew's Island from that point. The Dutch weren't the ones to ultimately take this colony. That was the English. In 1661, the newly instated Charles II of England chartered the Company of Royal Adventurers of England trading with Africa. First thing they did was harass the Dutch in Cape Verde. After taking an island, they sailed down to St. Andrew's Island. Otto couldn't tell whether the frigate was friendly or there to attack like the previous Dutch ships did. And as they say, when in doubt, shoot it down. So he fired upon the frigate and the captain threatened to level the fort on the island. Otto promptly gave the island up. The British held on to the island until a fire broke out and most of the stuff, including the munitions, were made useless. So then the island was abandoned by the British too. But this time, Otto didn't return. The duchy would never again hold the colony in Africa. But how about America? Well, after the Dutch side of the island heard of Jakob's capture, they pretty quickly thought up schemes to take over the entire island. One of the things they did was promote the idea that Jakob abandoned his American colony. You see, the Tobago colony was already in a pretty bad shape. Most of the original settlers were dead, even the priests dipped after a while, and now that the colony was no longer getting support or information, 
It didn't take much interference before the settlers gave up their fort in exchange for a trip back to Europe in 1659. The Dutch manned Fort Jakob for a while, but they mostly stayed on their original side since it was so much better. But just like in the Gambia, that wasn't the end of Jakob's involvement with the island. In 1664, Charles II signed a deal with Jakob. Charles would recognize Jakob's claim to Tobago in exchange for him giving up his claim to his colonies in the Gambia. The island would trade European hands like a game of hot potato for the next few years. In 1668, Jakob finally sent another group of settlers, but there was a mutiny on board and the ship was forced back. In 1680, when Jakob was around 69 years old, he sent a successful voyage led by an English lieutenant. Fort Jakob was left in ruins and in less than a year the lieutenant gave up and just went to Barbados. Thankfully, a year later, Colonel Monk led a second wave of colonizers that got to the island in 1681. Monk actually set up a permanent settlement on the island, though Monk defied Jakob's orders and attacked the locals which made living much harder. But the settlement somehow kept going. Jakob's colonial ambition was at least somewhat restored, although this would not be a very long-lived colony. At least Jakob wouldn't live to see it fail because on December 31st, 1681, after less than 40 years of being Duke, Jakob Kettler passed away. Jakob Kettler was an intelligent and ambitious man who took what he had and created something special. An economic boom and colonial network that, although short-lived and costly when it came to the lives of many settlers and African slaves, made him one of the most well-known people in Europe during his day. But exactly what made his rise to power so interesting and impressive were the limitations that his dukedom had. And those limitations were what led to his downfall. I say downfall, but even after the collapse of his colonies and the collapse of his economy, he was still able to bring the duchy back from a war and epidemic that devastated it. And his colonial ambition was still in him when he became 70, which allowed him to die with the knowledge that despite what happened in his late 40s, he didn't lose everything. There is a quote which is attributed to the King of Sweden, Karl X. I couldn't confirm whether this actually came from him, but I'm still gonna share it because it's quite apt. The quote goes, Jakob was too rich and powerful to be a duke, but he was too small and poor to become a king. Which sounds about right. 